Okay, and we are uh, on our way. We are recording the class as usual. <clears throat> Um, again, this is AA 100A, and this is the chapter on poetry. Started off last time, and we're picking up what we have left over this time around, inshallah. Uh, before I pressed um, the recording, I was asking you about your initial impressions now that we have uh, halfway through the chapter. Spoke enough uh, and long about what what poetry is. It's uh, how different poetry is from the other, um, you know, speeches and the other um, uh, types of uh, talk, if you like. And we said that poetry is unique, and you guys agreed. And we said that poetry is uh, a human experience, and uh, it is not limited to one culture or one place, right? Um, what else did we talk about? I uh, spoke about um, looking at the poem horizontally and vertically, and we said that when, when you look at the poem horizontally, you look at its meter, you measure it in terms of um, the metrical arrangement or organization of the line. We spoke about stresses and uh, unstressed syllables, and uh, we spoke about the beat that you hear uh, um, if you listen to a poem, and the beat that you make if you are writing uh, a poem yourself, remember? We spoke also about the uh, vertical aspect of any poem, the fact that um, at the end of every and each line, um, I mean, some, some of the lines come together, uh, um, and the sound uh, is identical or is the same. You normally have perhaps two lines rhyming together, uh, three lines, and, and so on and so forth. We also uh, make this graphical distinction between a poem and a non-poem, and we said that uh, in other discourses and in other uh, in texts that are not poetry, you have this margin to margin lines, but in poetry, it's a totally different experience where you normally have short lines and they are normally in the middle of uh, the page. Um, so you don't have this line, uh, I mean, margin to margin uh, experience that we see um, with other non uh, poetic texts. Um, what else did we talk about? We spoke about uh, how uh, people can approach uh, poetry. And uh, we said that uh, poetry is perhaps different than the other discourses uh, in terms of accessibility. It is accessible and everything, but it's not as accessible as the other uh, uh, perhaps literary forms and literary genres. Um, um, how? How is that so? Uh, like we um, like we said, if you're dealing with uh, poetry, you have to keep your guards up. Poetry is in as much as it is emotional, it is also intellectual. Intellectual means that you perhaps you need to, uh, um, you know, kind of reason with, with what is happening in the poem. You look at the uh, arrangement of the lines, you look at the organization of the different stanzas, and uh, um, it's, it's uh, I mean, it has this, uh, this uh, perhaps, which is, well, uh, some people may find my, 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 this very strange. Uh, when I look at poetry, I also um, have, I always have in mind uh, mathematics and mathematical uh, equations. And the poet is a very conscious individual who, who knows what he is doing. The idea that he is uh, perhaps uh, inspired by the muses is not, uh, very, um, you know, not not very accurate. He he does have his own calculations, 
because he he means something he or she of course he means something and he in order to get this something uh, um, across to the to to the reader uh, or to the uh, to the hearer he has to uh, kind of uh, um, you know think about things uh, uh, very thoroughly and very carefully so uh, uh, the idea or the myth that the poet is that individual who is passive and who uh, um, receives inspiration from the, the muses uh, is uh, partly true and partly uh, not very accurate because there is a great deal of home, homework that a poet has to do before he um, finalizes his poem. He can be unconscious when it comes to uh, perhaps drafting his poem, but when it comes to, to the uh, finish, uh, he has to uh, edit and uh, proofread and read again and look at uh, perhaps the meter uh, and also the rhyme scheme and, uh, um, and everything in between. Um, okay, what, what else did we say? We said that uh, in order to, uh, the idea of, of you know, reading about the poem before you actually read the poem is uh, is not correct. You start with the poem, uh, you read it thoroughly, you try to understand it as much as you can, because understanding is uh, perhaps not the, the proper or the right word when it comes to poetry, because our understanding may vary depending on uh, our backgrounds and uh, our level of uh, perhaps education and culture, um, our age I and mean, you. Uh, you read a poem when you're perhaps uh, 15 or 18, and when you read it again at 25 or perhaps 40, uh, I mean, the experience is different. I'm not saying that uh, the experience is going to be totally different. Uh, there are, of course, things that you uh, will, um, um, you know, your different selves uh, at 18 or at uh, perhaps 25 or 30 will, will agree on, but there are Again, things that you will uh, um, uh, perhaps come out with that, that you haven't uh, perhaps noticed or seen in your first reading. Um, the more you read, of course, uh, um, like everything else, uh, when, when, when we talk about poetry, the more poetry you read, uh, the more uh, perhaps uh, able you will be when it comes to, uh, I mean, appreciating it and also um, uh, you know, getting to, to the meaning. Uh, the meaning is up for grabs, as they say. I mean, it's, uh, uh, it depends on, on, on how well read you are, and it depends on your background, and, uh, and also it depends on, uh, on your exposure to poetry. So the, the more exposure, of course, the better, okay? Uh, what else did we talk about last time? idea of anthologies. We said that poetry is either, uh, I mean, it is of course composed and written by uh, um, poets, and some poets would opt to, to publish their own poetry, and some other poets are, you know, I mean, they publish their poetry, but they would allow other people to include their poetry in their anthologies. So we said that anthologies are collections of poetry by different poets. Um, again, this is very controversial and very pro uh, provocative, if you still remember, because no two people agree on uh, perhaps one list of uh, favorite uh, uh, poets. Again, every one of us has his own favorites. We may agree on a number of poems and a number of posts, but we may also uh, not agree on others. And this is where the problem arises. Uh, people would ask the editor of the anthology or the anthologist about his or her choices and why this and why not that. And um, uh, it, it may even get to, to the point that you may be accusing the editor or the anthologist of, of being uh, perhaps uh, sexist if he does not include women 
um, Eurocentric if he's not including non Europeans, um, uh, white supremacist if, if he's not including um, uh, African Americans, so blacks, Asians, right? So anthologies have their own uh, issues and problems. Um, again, we spoke about the anthology that we have here, the favorite an anthology of beasts. And we said that the focus is on beasts, and we defined uh, beasts, and we said that uh, beasts, beasts are animals, right? Um, again, um, I mean, the history of English literature has so many, um, you know, um, literary traditions when it comes to including and containing beasts and animals in anthologies. We have we have animal poetry, and um, again, you would ask about the the arrangement or the organization of the anthology that we have, and whether it was arranged uh, alphabetically or his, I mean, um, in normal uh, circumstances, you would um, you know kind of uh, arrange it historically or chronologically. You start with the old and then you move to the new. Um, this, this is one way. Um, uh, obviously, this is not the way that we have things uh, arranged in, in, in the anthology uh, that we have. Uh, it is uh, arranged um, alphabetically. And uh, when uh, the editor or the anthologist was asked about that, he said, um, he, he had a number of, you know, statements about that. It's, um, it's as if he is putting up a disclaimer. He's saying that I know that I'm an anthologist, and anthologists are by nature dictatorial in their choices, and they are even despotic. They don't uh, perhaps consult uh, other people when they choose, and they don't. Um, expect people to challenge their choices. I mean, he admits uh, and acknowledges that. Uh, when they asked him about this strange arrangement of um, um, of the poems into um, in uh, alphabetical order, he also said that I'm doing that because I'm. I'm um, if I start with the old, or with the, if I start in the traditional way, which means chronologically and historically and start with the uh, old poems and then move to new ones and, and to the modern, uh, people would uh, be uh, uh, under the, 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 the impression that I'm favoring uh, uh, whatever uh, comes first, which is the old. He's saying that I am doing that in order to have um, uh, perhaps some kind of um, democracy, if you like, when it comes to um, to the poems. I'm not, um, I'm not trying to say it this way. Uh, people wouldn't understand that I'm saying that the, the ancient poets were better than the new uh, or the modern ones. No, um, I don't intend uh, to give uh, this indication. Uh, and in order to do that, I uh, uh, choose the alphabetical order. Uh, people may not be uh, very convinced with what he is saying, but this is actually uh, what he said about this uh, perhaps uh, un uh, uh, or non-traditional way uh, of putting the poems. Uh, um, this is in and of itself um, um, something that we're talking about. I mean, the idea of, you know, tradition. So obviously, even the anthologist is, is um, challenging the, the tradition of, of organizing, you know, uh, poets in an, uh, poems in an anthology. He, he himself is um, challenging the, the traditional way of doing that. The traditional way of doing that would be uh, uh, like I said, it would be the, the chronological or the historical one, where we start with the old and then you move on to the new. 
uh, um, he is uh, obviously challenging uh, that. Um, and like I said, he has his own um, strange reasons. And among or on top of, of these reasons would be the idea that he is trying to be fair to the new poets. He does not want people to get the feeling that by starting with uh, old poets that he is favoring them or that he is preferring them or recommending them perhaps more than the new ones. He said no. It's alphabetical order is neutral and it would uh, uh, send the right message uh, to uh, people. <clears throat> okay. So uh, three poems that we're having, actually more than three because we have three and then we move to D.H. Lawrence with his own poems. Um, okay, so what are the poems that we're featuring in the chapter and that are taken from the Faber, uh, the Faber Book of Beasts? We have uh, the fly and we have, uh, actually we have two the flies, right? Two, number two I mean, and fly one and fly two. And we also have the flea. If you look at them, you are going to see that they belong to different uh, times and different time periods. Um, again, one of them is old. The, um, one of them is, um, you know, is not as old in terms of time. And the third is modern, uh, perhaps contemporary, if, if the poet is alive and kicking. Again, this is a living up to the scheme that he has, the alphabetical scheme that uh, um, the, the anthologist has. Um, we will um, not, not strange anymore. If we start with Blake, we have Blake and we have Don, uh, John Don, and we have uh, Mersulav. Uh, obviously, we, we, uh, they belong to, to three different uh, poetic traditions and practices. One of them is William Blake, who happens to be a romantic poet. A romantic poet means that he, um, he used to live and work um, perhaps at the end or towards the end of the, uh, 19th century, uh, the uh, 18th century and the early 19th century. Uh, you have Don, who was, uh, <clears throat> um, you know, in, in the 17th century, if I'm not mistaken. And you have Merslav, who is contemporary, who is uh, perhaps alive. So, um, again, how can we have them? If we're adopting the chronological order, we wouldn't have, we would have Merslav at the end. We, and we wouldn't start with William Plague, because William Plague is newer uh, than John Donne. Um, we should have started with Don, John uh, Don, and then William Blake, and then um, the third uh, port, but we're not having that. Um, again, the focus is perhaps um, uh, more on, on, on the themes and the ideas. So one commonality and one rationale behind, uh, behind uh, perhaps uh, putting uh, a number of poets together, uh, perhaps at the beginning or at the end or in the middle would be uh, the fact that they have common uh, subjects. They talk perhaps about the same beast or the, the same animal, right? So these are reasons why <clears throat> Um, the editor or the anthologist is adopting the non chronological order. If you like. <clears throat> Let's go to the um, to the slides and see what we uh, what is in in store for us.
I'm uploading the file. Okay, so can you see that? Yes. Okay. Yes, okay. yes, yes, we can see it. Yes, I can. Okay, okay, interesting. Um, okay. Uh, remember, this is the table of count as far as the chapter is concerned. Uh, we had this introduction about uh, poetry and uh, what poetry is and stuff. And then we talk about the uh, idea of tradition when it comes to poetry. So um, are, are we unfamiliar with the idea of tradition? Of course not. We've been talking about tradition and the challenge that some people uh, pose to tradition for quite some time. We did that with Christopher Marlowe, who is a, a big challenger of tradition, if you like, uh, a big challenger of orthodoxies, whether those orthodoxies are religious, um, societal, political. Remember in his Dr. Faustus and the fact that Faustus was trying to go beyond uh, human limitations, which is obviously um, um, a transgression that he would pay very dearly uh, for. And then uh, we also had um, this uh, uh, interplay uh, between tradition um, and new ideas when we spoke about, uh, you know, uh, was it Cezanne that we did? Yeah, Cezanne. And of course, you know that Cezanne was never a traditionalist. And uh, one reason why he got rejected from the salon was the fact that he wouldn't accept a traditional uh, methods when it comes to painting. So this is tradition and of course uh, against the idea of innovation. And then uh, we went all the way to Plato and of course you know that Plato was against uh, traditional moral beliefs. And why was he against them? It's simply because he believes that they are. We uh, take them on trust. We never question them. We are never allowed to question them. And as a rationalist philosopher, he wouldn't accept that. He said that everything has to go through the mind. Everything has to be, uh, be put to the test. And uh, uh, our measurement would be the mind, our power of reason. If our reason accepts, those moral traditions, we, we would be more than happy to embrace and accept. If our mind does not accept them, um, sorry, um, I wouldn't, uh, as, uh, as a, a rational philosopher, I wouldn't accept them. Um, and then we have, of course, um, uh, the, the poetry book part where um, the, the, the tradition this time around is not uh, tradition or traditions of painting, in the case of Cezanne, not tradition of uh, or, or moral traditions in, in, in the case of Plato. Um, this time around we have um, traditional poetic practices. And we, um, as we have seen last time, we have this uh, challenge to those uh, uh, poetic uh, practices. So it's not moral tradition or traditions anymore. It's uh, the challenge this time around is to the prevailing poetic practices. Um, so is it only about the method? Is it only about how people write poetry? Uh, no, it's, it's about the how and also the what. The how would have to do with whether I'm going to, uh, as a poet, use the old poetic forms. Would I use the sonnet, for example? Would I be lyrical and use uh, the, um, the, the lyrical form would I use the epic? These are established.
established and well known and traditional forms. So would I challenge them and use my own? This is the how part. The, the, the what part would be with the ideas. Okay, the ideas that the poet promotes. Should I recycle old ideas or have my own original ideas that are inspired by my actuality, by my uh, um, my local environment, by the time that I am born in? Should I also uh, perhaps imitate classical models in both in their forms and their content, or should I have my own voice and tone? Remember when we spoke about that, we said as a poet, you start of traditional, traditional in the sense that you use old forms. You use the sonnet, you use the, the lyric, you use the epic. These are forms that people would know you uh, through. And then uh, perhaps after a while, when you develop your own voice, you can start your own uh, thing. But uh, you start off as a poet, as a traditionalist, and then over time you make the transition to whatever is new, whether in terms of ideas or in terms of forms, right? So what happens to those who stay traditions? A poet who started off traditional and he ends up tradition. This is, uh, of course, um, his poetry wouldn't be uh, very admired. Uh, because, I mean, why would I um, follow an imitator if I can go to the original poet? If you keep imitating till the end of your life as a poet, this is not uh, something new. And people uh, and readers and hearers and listeners want something new, okay? They uh, recognize you if you use traditional forms, but up to a limit, right? After that, they are going to ask you for whatever is new, right? <clears throat> we spoke about these things, if you still remember what a poem is, what a poet is, and poetry. Poetry is a genre in and of itself, if you still remember. We spoke about the characteristics of poetry in terms of, uh, you know, uh, um, in the graphical interface, whatever you see, whatever meets your eye on, on the page, and said that poetry is not um, a margin to margin uh, experience. And we said that the, um, you, when you talk about poetry, talk about horizontally, uh, horizontally and vertically. Uh, horizontally, you talk about the, the rhythm and the meter, and vertically, you talk about the rhyme and the rhyme scheme. And of course, within the poem itself, we talk about the imagery and the figures of speech. Okay, uh, we said that in order to uh, perhaps um, um, appreciate a poem, you don't only look at the meaning, you don't start with the meaning, you look at the structure, you look at the form, and then you make uh, 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 the transition to the meaning. Uh, you look at the internal music. This is actually what counts when it comes to poetry. The uh, internal, uh, you look at the intrinsic values of a poem, not what other people are saying about the poem, right? Uh, and also the idea that you need to look at a poem with fresh eyes. You need to drop the idea of the canon. We spoke about the canon before. Uh, and we said that the canon can be a problem because if if you have if you're reading a poem by a canonized poet, sometimes you have apprehensions uh, and fears. Uh, you, you say, how can I uh, judge a poet who is established? Or who uh, um, you know, everybody is obviously talking about and is praising. Who am I to judge a poem? No, this is not correct. Approach a poem with a fresh with fresh eyes. That's why we said that you shouldn't be reading critical material about a poem before you read the poem itself, right? 
So if you read critical material about the poem, you're likely to get influenced by what other people are saying about the poem. So your experience when you approach the poem is not at all fresh, right? And you're going to find yourself subscribing to what they said. If they say that this poem is good, you, you find yourself uh, finding justifications that it is good, when in, in, in actual fact it is not. We spoke about the idea of the canon. If you have a, perhaps a poem or a play by Shakespeare, and of course Shakespeare is uh, on top of the canon. So when you read Shakespeare, and of course the guy is all over the place, people are going to say, and you're going to start to judge. Uh, you know, verses that he wrote, uh, you know, an act of a play that he has, uh, he, ha he wrote or something, uh, you find yourself, um, you know, unable to, uh, to say um, what, what you have, I mean, because you might receive uh, uh, backlash. People are going to say, who are you to, to speak about uh, Shakespeare? In uh, using those negative terms, uh, Shakespeare is the high and the mighty uh, play, playwright, right? So again, whenever you have a poem, you need to always uh, divorce the poem from the author of the poem. Um, you need to also, uh, um, like I said, to start with the poem uh, itself. You need to also feel free to uh, speak up your mind, to say uh, it's bad or it's good. It's bad because of this and that, it's good because of this and that. Okay, okay. What else did we talk about? We spoke about, uh, well, lost anthologies. We spoke about the idea of imitation, the fact that, uh, like I said in five minutes earlier, we said that imitation is, is good and everything, but up to a limit. Okay, you as a poet, you start off uh, as a, a copier or an imitator. You imitate, uh, um, you know, traditional models. That's fine. So, so, so uh, you, you, you're training yourself. Okay, you develop using those models. And in order for people to recognize you, but over time, you'll have to change. You'll have to have your own voice. You have to have your own uh, way of writing, uh, whether we're talking on, on the level of, uh, of the forms that you're adopting and also on the level of the ideas <clears throat> that you are trying to get across to your audience or to your readers. Um, <clears throat> we, uh, we said that at the core of the um, poetic experience we have this idea of personification. And we said that personification is also part and parcel of our life. Personification is something that we do on, on, on a daily or an hourly basis without knowing that we're doing it. Um, it's, it's, it's the idea of giving human attributes and human features to a non-human, uh, uh, you know, Entity, whether we're talking about inanimates or even animals and stuff. Um, I think um, um, the table comes readily to mind. When we talk about a table, and we say the table has four legs. So who 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 has legs? Human beings, right? But this is a metaphor. This is a personification, right? Uh, remember last time we spoke about uh, Asil Hillani, remember? And uh, our friend, uh, what's his name? Sorry. Um, Baskal. I'm sorry, Baskal, Allah, Allah. I keep forgetting your name. Um, yeah, this is cognitive de decline. I'm, I'm almost 50 now. That's only natural that I forget <laughs> names. Uh, okay, so anyway, remember Asit Hillani last time we spoke about him and his very popular song, and he was uh, obviously uh, that there was this big loss that he suffered. Uh, obviously, his lady love got killed or got um, 
uh, she she died somehow, and um, his life turned upside down. And um, it, it's not only his life; it's the life of the different objects in the house. Even uh, to the extent that, that the door was uh, was uh, obviously crying. Amrak she she remember Pascal. Amrak she 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 <laughs> Amrak, she 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 bad. <laughs> uh, remember? So it's it's true. I mean, uh, what, what was yeah, yeah. Uh, yes. it? Yes. It was amazing song. Uh, it was an amazing song indeed. Um, um, again, if you I mean, if you look uh, up. Uh, if you try to look up um, um, the idea of personification, you're going to find it all over the place in our daily uh, life. Um, when I said, um, let me tell you about my experience. Um, what do I do in Jeddah together with being a teacher? I am the head of the English department. Okay, the head. So this is this is metaphorical, right? This is a personification, right? Can you see that? I'm sorry, I, I can't hear what? Uh, I'm, I'm talking about when you say that somebody is the head of something, the head of a department, the head of a university. So head is obviously... It's, it's a metaphor. Ah, yeah, this is what we're saying, the personification. I'm trying to say that personification is all over the place. Yes, and so it's it is, like uh, istiara. Ah, yes. Uh, I mean, I would use a istiara would be perhaps a <clears throat> satam, very technical. I would use the, the word tashkhis. Oh, I'm, I'm Hamza. Uh, okay. Uh, okay, Hamza, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, so... Sorry. Uh, <laughs> Uh, long, long time no, no here. I mean, you haven't been as active as you used to, your hands. Obviously, we're, you, uh, we're uh, kind of uh, confusing between you and Sattar. You guys yeah, have the same because of this sound uh, voice. The same voice, right? Yeah, I think okay. so. Yeah. Okay, interesting. Um, okay, so this is uh, personification, and uh, like I said, this is uh, poetry is. Um, or at the core of poetry, you have personification, which is a variation on the idea of metaphors. And uh, if, if you have a whole work um, that is rooted in this idea of personification, where we're giving uh, in, uh, in um, you know, um, non-human entities, uh, human attributes, we would uh, call uh, uh, this phenomenon, anthropo uh, anthropomorphism. <laughs> I learned it in the hard way. It's difficult to pronounce. It's uh, it's quite mouthful, but it's it's very nice. So anthropomorphism is um, when you have a whole work, um, whether it's poetry or uh, non-poetry, uh, having you know animals or other creatures. Um, um, having human attributes. Uh, I spoke last time with you about uh, Animal Farm, a very famous novel by George Orwell. And I said that, that's, um, you know, you, you have um, uh, this, it talks about this farm where it's more or less like, um, you know, a country that those uh, animals are running. They apply the rules of uh, um, of government, um, they they talk about politics. They talk uh, about the. Um, um, I mean, it's it's all rooted in politics, and of course, the message uh, uh, or the messages were were very clear. And, uh, obviously, at one point, they would try to kind of depose the the ruler for the bad practices. Okay. Yes. Can I finish what uh, I say? I don't can, understand. Can, okay, can, can okay. I finish my okay, line of thought? It's okay. Um, again, uh, this is called anthrop uh, anthropomorphism. And um, uh, if you're familiar with um, Aesop or Aether, 
Uh, this is, of course, an um, a, Greek, uh, a Greek name or proper noun. Um, so it's, it's either uh, Aesop or Aesop. E and Aesop is, uh, um, we don't know whether he, he actually existed or this is, uh, or um, he is a legendary um, figure. And Aesop has his own tales. Uh, he has a whole uh, uh, tradition of, you know, stories where animals uh, speak like us, they think and they, um, they uh, perhaps trick each other. Um, they, uh, they do all the things that we do, um, um, whether the, the good ones or the bad ones. They are uh, perhaps as honest as times they perhaps they are as um, um, tricky at other times they are so there is a moral in every and each tale given by Aesop so we have literary antecedents uh, uh, when it comes to having or featuring you know beasts and animals in, in the work of art um, uh, yeah, somebody was asking something. Go ahead. Uh, yes, uh, I don't understand the difference. Can you, can you, uh, can you, can you I mean, tell us what? your name? Your uh, name is my Tausen. name is Tausen. Ah, yes, and a few Yes. Yeah, okay. Go ahead, Lisa. Yes, I, I don't know uh, the difference between uh, anthropomorphism oh, yeah. and mm. uh, metaphor. Uh, uh, well, uh, uh, when it comes to uh, anthropomorph anthropomorphism, we're talking about large scale, uh, a large scale, I mean, a work where um, this, um, uh, th this device is used on a large scale. And um, when we talk about a whole novel, Okay, when I talk, when I, uh, I talk about a whole play where uh, the characters are all animals or um, perhaps other non-human uh, creatures and uh, entities. Uh, Dr. Yes, they're kind of like two opposites. So, for example, anthropomorphism is like uh, is like tajsim uh, in Arabic. There is something is. Uh, uh, not really clear, and pe and people take it like uh, literally. Well, um, uh, or, 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 or as a physical thing. <clears throat> I beg to differ. I mean, you have taken us so far away, Hans. Oh, sorry. No, let's go back. Let's go back to <coughs> again. Let's agree on the fact that you know uh, personification is perhaps uh, a metaphor is an extended personification. So uh, we're, we're making this uh, distinction between metaphors and personifications on the one hand and anthropomorphism on the other, okay? So like I said, when we talk about metaphors, when we talk about similes, uh, I'm sorry, personifications, we, uh, this is limited. If you have a poem, you have a line or two where you have the personification. But uh, whenever you have a, a, you know, a whole uh, piece of work where all the characters uh, um, are animals, um, are non-human entities, this is, this is called um, anthropomorphism. See? Like, I give you the example of the cartoons that you see uh, or watch on, on a daily basis, right? Where yes, human, yes. Uh, you know, if you uh, if you compare the number of humans to the number of non-humans in any cartoon, you're going to find that the animals outweigh uh, uh, the uh, human beings, right? Um, what else? I mean, like I said, if you if you look Aesop up and if you look up his fables and stories, you're going to find them all about animals acting and behaving like human beings, okay, with explicit 
moral lessons, okay? Not cheat, not betray the trust of other people, uh, not, uh, um, not, you shouldn't be uh, perhaps, um, you know, uh, you should humble down, you, sh you shouldn't be blaming uh, others for your faults and uh, yeah, failings, okay? So these are all more lessons that animals uh, communicate to us uh, in those anthropomorphic situations. Remember, Kelly, I mean, why, 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 why go very far away to Ether? You're familiar with Kalila Udemna, yes. right? Yes. So uh, what's happening in Kalila Udemna? Who are, do we have human beings? Uh, no. Uh, no. Yeah, this is, no. this is uh, a typical anthropomorphic uh, work of, uh, of art, right? Yes. And yeah, the metaphor is like, is, uh, is like um, uh, Christopher Marlowe's uh, stories. Um, more or less, yes, that's that's correct. Yeah. Uh, okay, but let's move on. Um, I'm not going to repeat that. This has taken so long. I wouldn't repeat it. Again, we spoke about the idea of tradition as opposed to the idea of dissent. Dissent means that you don't agree with tradition. Uh, okay, and we have different levels of dissent. Uh, sometimes you have people, uh, you have dissenters who uh, wouldn't agree uh, with anything. They just dissent. Uh, perhaps it's part of their psychological makeup to say no, no, no. And this is obviously not healthy, okay? There are things that you be you can be, uh, you know, not agreeing about, but there are still things that uh, uh, we would uh, approve of and accept, right? So the idea of saying no to everything is very negative and very destructive. Okay, this is a level of dissent where you say no, no, no. And this is perhaps would apply, this would apply to Cezanne, for example. So, um, um, if you still remember, tradition, traditional, um, you know, practices when it comes to painting were all uh, animal, right? Um, again, you have another level of descent that would uh, accept only things uh, that would go through the mind. And this would be uh, Plato, if you still remember. And you have a third level of descent, this poetic descent that we talk about. The idea that you yourself as a poet start off as a, a traditional poet. You start uh, using, you start off, you start your poetic career using old and traditional forms. And obviously there is nothing wrong with that until you have you you have developed your own tools, mental, poetic, whether on the level of the forms and or on on the uh, this time around. The idea that you, you start off a traditionalist, but over time you have to descend. And the word descent here would, wouldn't be negative because this is a welcome descent, if you want. If you keep copying other people when it comes to poetry, of course. If you keep uh, using their methods, if you keep recycling their poetic ideas, their ideas, so you wouldn't be welcomed. But people are going to start questioning you. why. Keep, uh, we we got we we knew now uh, we knew uh, or we know we now know you so you are recognized so you you got the recognition that you wanted by using old methods start something new otherwise we're going to be to get bored and we're going to take away the recognition that we have given right so this is uh, a different level of descent that is welcome. You start off as a poet, very traditional, using established models, using 
traditional models, but models. But at one point, you have to make the transition to new ideas and new techniques. So what happens if, if you stay the same? No, uh, people are going to lose interest in you uh, down the line. And we have um, an excellent example, and this is what we're coming to. The example of D.H. Lawrence, for example, and his poetry. Uh, he started off as traditions in, in the sense that he was uh, perhaps uh, under the influence of William Blake and Walt Whitman. He was using their models. He was perhaps recycling their, their ideas. And then he developed his own ideas and his own methods, and he started to change. Okay, this change is a welcome change, like I said. Okay. Okay, so we spoke enough about, um, you know, anthologies and what anthologies mean, and uh, spoke enough about um, um, this idea of, uh, you know, alphabetical arrangement of the poems and the poets, um, and the fact that um, this this is kind of strange, and this is kind of uh, um, atypical. Atypical is the opposite of typical, atypical, or strange and unfamiliar. To have an anthology and that that has this uh, strange, strange arrangement, alphabetical word. Uh, people are used to having anthologies that start with the old and then move to the new. Okay. So do we have reasons? Yes, he said, I mean, the anthologist. Um, and this anthology is saying, um, listen, I'm doing that because I don't want you to have this feeling that uh, perhaps uh, old poets and old poems are greater than their um, contemporary or new counterparts. No, this is not what I have in mind, and that's why I am adopting a, st a strategy that you may find weird or strange. What is your strategy? It is arranging the poems in an alphabetical order. <clears throat> okay, thank you, sir. Um, uh, the, the thing that we perhaps didn't talk about uh, was the choice of the anthologist. Yeah, uh, in our case, we have uh, Paul Meldon. Um, he is an established anthologist. He did a number of anthologies before, perhaps about Irish poets and Irish literature. Um, you don't just um, choose any, any person to uh, compile poems into an anthology, right? There, there has to be, um, um, you know, a set of criteria for that. So what is the criteria? The criteria for choosing Paul, uh, Paul Milton, for example, was that he was a distinguished and established poet uh, who had won a number of literary prizes. Uh, he is known, he has done uh, similar and, and uh, anthologies in the past, and they had uh, their measure of success, if you like. Okay. So again, despite the fact that he is an established anthologist, despite the fact that he enjoys respect among uh, the literary in the literary circles, still. His choices are going to also be challenged because, like I said, every one of us has his own list of preferences when it comes to poets, right? So if you don't see your poet featured in the anthology, you would accuse uh, the anthologist of, uh, uh, of, of uh, perhaps one thing or, or another, right? You would even uh, accuse him of not having perhaps the, the right attitude, the, the, the right 
um, you know, perceptual and uh, appreciating filters and all these kinds of things. Um, again, um, the publisher would be very important when when you look at an anthology, you also look at the publisher, the publishing house. If the publishing house is as respected, um, as respected, of course, as the anthologist, that would also be fine, right? Again, uh, what is interesting about Meldon is that he is not making big claims about his anthology. He's saying that I'm just another anthologist with feelings and weaknesses. He says that we anthologists are despotic and dictatorial. We don't like people to come over and challenge our choices. I know. He says that I know about that. Um, he said, well, we wouldn't be able to accommodate the attitudes and the tastes of everyone. And he says that if, uh, if we are willing to do that, it means that um, uh, an anthology that perhaps ha has 200 or 300 pages would be 500 and perhaps uh, 1,000 pages. And in this case, the, the price would be high, way higher. And this is something that we don't want uh, to see. Okay, so for, for also for economic reasons, we limit ourselves to uh, certain choices. If, if you want me to cater for the needs and the tastes of everyone, uh, I'll end up having 1,000 pages. And of course, you would take the price and the cost into consideration. <clears throat> We're done with that. Okay, so let's move to the poems that we have tonight. <clears throat> um, so the first one, as you can see, um, we have three poems about ancestors. We have The Fly by William Blake, we have The Flea by John Donne, and we have The Fly, Another Fly, or Another The Fly by Mirchnav Hollow. You can almost tell that William Blake and John Donne are English speaking. English speaking means that they belong to the English speaking world, right? And they do, and, and they are English. Uh, Mershlav Holof does not sound, I mean, the name does not sound too English, right? And he is not English. He is, uh, I think, from uh, perhaps um, the Czech Republic. We, we'll, we'll see in a minute. Uh, but when you look at the arrangement, when you uh, get to know, for example, that the fly came first in the anthology, uh, the first fly by William Blake, and then you have the second fly, uh, and then the flea, and then uh, Mishlav Halov, the third one. You see that the arrangement, like we agreed, is not chronological. If it was chronological or historical, we should have started with the flea, right? And then we uh, go to the fly, and then we end up with uh, Mishlav Halov's fly, right? Um, again, like I said, the reason why we're having them together because of perhaps the shared experience. We're talking about a, a shared topic or a shared theme uh, or subject matter. Then we're talking about N6 and also the fact that the writer is trying or the uh, Melton is trying to say, uh, listen, uh, I don't have preferences. I'm not saying that uh, old is good or new is bad. And I'm putting them together in an alphabetical way. Okay, this is the first poem. And I think I asked you to read it last time. And I'm asking you to read it again. Uh, I'll give you uh, perhaps uh, three minutes to read it. 
And one very important thing about poetry would be the idea that poetry uh, is not as accessible as normal or regular speech. It is so intense and so condensed in terms of form, as you can see, and in terms of meaning. Whatever other people say in hundreds of pages is, is said in a few lines. Look at the challenge, hence the challenge. So poetry is not for, um, what, do, what do they say? Uh, is not, uh, should I say, uh, um, is not for everyone? No, I shouldn't be saying that because this is bad. If you are a sensible human being, if you have a mind enough, uh, I think you can do it. You can read poetry. It's only a, a matter of practice. It's a matter of, you know, training your eyes and training your uh, perhaps ears because it's, um, it's always good to, to, to listen to poetry. And also, uh, if you cannot have it, um, you know, if, if, if you cannot listen, at least you can listen to yourself read poetry. It can make all the difference, I promise you. Okay, so let's read the poem. Uh, I would like you to mute your mics uh, and start reading the poem out loud. Okay? We give you perhaps. Don't stop at details. Don't stop at difficult words. Just read it um, and try to connect the dots. And this is actually not going to happen from the first reading. I'll give you uh, um, um, the time to read it twice. Okay. Um, give yourself the opportunity uh, to appreciate poetry. Again, poetry is for everyone, provided that you approach it in the right way. Go ahead, mute your mics, and start reading the poem. Read the poem once, and then read it one more time, and uh, um, you need to develop the habit of taking down notes. The observations that you have or you make while reading and after reading, Okay, uh, connecting the dots together, moving from whatever horizontal to whatever is vertical, looking at the intrinsic values of the poem rather than what other people are saying about the poem. So go ahead, you guys have uh, three minutes from now. Go ahead, and, and I'll read it along. Go ahead. <clears throat>
Okay. So how many times have you read it? Once? Uh, three times. Yeah, that's good. Okay. Anybody else? Once, twice? Yeah, I have I have read it. You have read it how many times? Four three times? times. Yes. Three times. <laughs> okay. So let me ask you about the experience. Do you do you think that um I mean, every time you read it, do, do you come up with new ideas? Do you come up with new realizations and new revelations? Or, or, is, or is it all the same, reading it once or three times? Anything? Give me your take on that. Yeah, the mic is yours, everyone. For me, I don't notice any any different about uh, when I read it for the first time and second time. I don't notice any difference. Okay, that's interesting. Can we have somebody else? Hello. Yes, Doctor. What's your question? Yes. Uh, my my question uh, is about. Uh, the different readings that you made or you did, you read the poem a number of times. Um, if you read it twice, um, is the second reading adding to your knowledge about the poem? Does it make any difference whether we read the poem uh, only once or a number of times? Oh yeah, definitely it shows like differentiation between how you read it like for the first time, the second time. Mm -hmm. Like by the second time, you could imagine the scene that's happening right there. Okay, so the second, it's not a waste of time if we read it twice or three times, right? No, no, absolutely not. In because poetry, up, there's no wasting time. Yeah, that's interesting. That's that's good. Can we have somebody else? Impressions? Yes, Dr. Yes, yes well, Dr. Go ahead. Yes. Um, I th well, the, th the second time I read it, I, s I, I see the, the rhyme is more detailed than the first time. Mm, interesting. Good, good, good. Yeah. Good. Yeah. So it added to your uh, perhaps experience. Yes. So the the more you, the, the, I mean, the more times you read it, the more involved you are, if you like. Right? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Hamza. Thank you, Doctor. Okay. Good. So whatever. Uh, okay. So, uh, this is it's a poem. Why? Why do you think it's a poem? If 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 um, I didn't tell you that the, the chapter is about poetry, if I didn't tell you that this is a, a sample poem, how would you recognize a poem? Uh, can I answer again? Uh, again, yeah, please. Uh, from the rhymes, from the metaphors with the rhymes. Um, <laughs> from anthropomorphism in the rhymes as well. No, uh, so let me uh, perhaps rephrase my question. Oh. Let's, uh, uh, I'm asking you to look at the poem from afar, from a distance. Okay, you look at yes. it and you recognize it as a poem. How? Why didn't you say that this is perhaps an essay? Or this is perhaps a paradox. Can I answer? Uh, okay. Can I answer? Uh, because of the because of the rhymes that you can see. Uh, okay, so uh, let's say that you your. Uh, it's not a full line. Uh, wait, wait. Let, let, let me let me finish. Yes. Mine. Okay, let's say that you are looking from. Uh, like I said, it's it's a distance where you cannot make you can yeah, wait wait Kalini uh, establish what I'm trying to say, and then you are on your way. I'll leave you to uh, to speak as much as you want. Uh, okay, again, and um, uh, let's forget about the fact that you can see uh, rhyme or rhymed lines. Your hands. I think it's okay. Uh, it's, it's from. Uh, I, I haven't finished. It. I haven't finished. It. Okay, from afar. Short lines, short lines. Okay, so short lines. 
And Short it's lines, a, uh, vertical. Yeah. Uh, it's what I want to the stanzas. Yeah, well, the, the, the stanzas. stanzas. How many stanzas? No, it is uh, the rhythm, doctor. Rhythm. Yeah. What do you mean? And you like uh, Arabic poem also. There is a rhythm. Ah, uh, uh, yeah. I mean, uh, the, do, do, don't you remember that I said that you don't have this, um, you know, uh, margin to margin kind of thing? It's in the middle. The lines are short, right? Yeah. Yeah. This is without without reading, yes. without check, checking whether there, there is rhyme or not, whether there, there is beat or not, right? You can almost tell from... Yes afar that this is a poem okay because um having something in the middle the only thing that um, the only genre where you have the lines that short you have the lines uh, not moving from one one margin to another is the poetic genre this is what i'm trying to say and then you go to the poem proper you read it and then you look out for uh, or look at things uh, that uh, um, Hamza is talking about. Uh, the rhyme, uh, the rhythm, the imagery. Yeah, the vertical uh, whether, imagery from the... Now, from the... now whether uh, we have personifications or not, right? Yeah, very good. Yes, correct. Yes, and the sir. incomplete sentences completed by the next lines. Yes, yes, very good. This is called enjumpment, by the way. And jump. Uh, and jump and jump <laughs> and jump. Oh. We'll talk about that. This is uh, okay. Uh, did, did, didn't you notice that even the the words are perhaps different from some of the words are uh, quite unfamiliar to us, right? Um, the uh, when uh, when you say thy, for example, when you say thou, right? So this is what we call poetic diction. Diction means vocabulary and words. So poetry has its own diction. The diction of poetry is obviously different from non-poetry. Uh, to the extent that sometimes it happens that you have people using poetic language in normal speech. Do you know what they call this guy? Or this guy for that matter? <laughs> you know, when you use poetic language in normal speech, they accuse you of being mutaqahir, right? Yes. Uh, I was told at one point I was defending my masters and, uh, you know, one of the uh, jurors, one of those who, uh, I mean, uh, the professors that were uh, asking me questions, he said, Samah Batal Taqawar. You see? Because I was, I mean, using, uh, I mean, big words and poetic words as if I was in, a, in an epic, uh, you know, holding my, my poetic sword and I'm fighting everybody. Right? So this is called, uh, I mean, poetry has its own diction. Okay, we call it poetic diction. When you, uh, we don't use the word thy. Thy means my. Do we use thy? <laughs> no, of course. Do we use thou? Thou means you. Right? Uh, together, we're, I mean, the poem is small. That's why we don't have so many strange words. We'll, we'll, we'll see other poems. Uh, where you have those, uh, um, you know, unfamiliar uh, words, uh, w which is obviously ca a characteristic of poetry. Okay, so now that we have established the fact that it is a poem, because uh, in, I mean, the, um, we don't have this margin to margin lines. Now that we have established the fact that the lines are short, and now that we have read the poem and uh, the, the, I mean, the thing, and we found that there is, uh, or there are rhyming lines, and we can almost feel and hear the beat when we read the lines, okay? I think we can come up with the, it is, to, it is safe to say that this is a poem. Good, okay. 
Um, did you so did you get what the, the, the poet is trying to say? <clears throat> uh, did you notice that he is kind kind of uh, establishing very strange connections? <coughs> yes. Okay. How? You mean the meaning behind the whole poem? No, I, I'm talking about the, the, the connections that the poet is making. Well, he connected himself to a fly. Yeah, which is which is what? Which is strange, obviously. Which is unfamiliar and strange. And this is uh, this is part of the beauty of poetry. Yeah, of it, course. It it um, it challenges your senses, if you like. It challenges your um, um, your perhaps your beliefs. Uh, it challenges your way of looking at things. Right? It makes you look at things in a fresh way, in an unorthodox way. Okay. Right? Well, yeah, as I said before, like if you don't have an imaginative uh, mind, reading poetry could be hard for you. Like if you mm -hmm. can't imagine things as the way uh, it is. Yes. yes, yes, yes. Okay, so we have this strange uh, connection that the poet established between the human being and the fly. So for whatever reason, in the final analysis, what is it that he is trying to, to say? Um, is he, uh, let, me, let me rephrase it for you. Um, is he comparing the, um, I don't know how to put it, is he, uh, you know, relying on the experience of the fly and say that the human beings are like the fly? Or is he relying on the experience of human beings and say that uh, uh, the fly is like human beings? Are you getting the idea? What, what's what's, what's the, the point of commonality, if you like, between the two? What do they share? The idea of death. Uh, the idea of death. He's comparing between a human and the fly. Yes, um, and there has to be a point of comparison. So the point of comparison, like, uh, what's your name? Uh, somebody said the idea of death. Death. <coughs> Sousen. Sousen, okay. Uh, is it the, uh, I mean, so, I mean, uh, flies die, human beings die, but this is not, only common to flies and human beings. I mean, other creatures and animals also die. There is something unique about the fly or about insects. So it's not about death in its uh, entirety, because we, I mean, lots of creatures die. Yeah, Mariam Melajami is raising her hand. I don't know. The fly is weak, uh, doctor. Excellent. The fly, like Luai is saying, the fly is weak, very vulnerable. Okay? It is as if he's trying to say what? Uh, teacher, the fly is also, uh, also only lives for like seven days, so it's kind of like a child experience or something. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, I mean, come again, I'm, uh, I didn't get to the... Uh, flies only live for like seven days or so, around that. Oh, you see? Yeah, excellent. This is a very good idea. And, and how long? What, what is our, um, you know... So it's like a very short experience. Uh, short experience yeah. or perhaps uh, this is uh, uh, an indication that um, no matter how long we live as human beings, we also die. Our life is short. Yeah, that is also true. Yeah, yeah, perhaps he is um, comparing the two uh, lives and he's saying uh, no matter how, how, how old we are, we still have to uh, kind of die. So this would point to the 
Uh, and also the, the, the fly, what is also so characteristic about a fly is that it is words. So somebody said that it's very weak. Uh, what what does it take and how much does it take to to kill a fly one moment uh, in, in terms of second tools, in terms of tools would you need more than perhaps the back of your hand or your bomb no, no. Your hand is enough no <laughs> right but uh, provided that you wash your hands after you do that right <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> okay. So again, uh, in in front of us, flies are mere playthings. It doesn't take big to kill one, right? Uh, look at human beings and look at nature. Uh, no. Which is bigger? Which is bigger? Which is more closer? Nature or the human beings? Nature. Okay. Nature. So what, what does it take to, uh, to damage the life and destroy the life of a human being when it comes to nature? I think it's second day, doctor. It takes uh, perhaps heavy rains. It takes uh, an earthquake. Right? Yes. So uh, yes. don't you think don't you think that we are as vulnerable? Don't you think that it, we are as weak as flies? Yes, of course. In a matter of, of proportion. Yes. Right. Um, I, I, am I reading uh, perhaps uh, much into it? Do you think that I am perhaps exagger exaggerating or something? No, you're doing just fine. Like, oh, okay. I mean, yeah, okay, go ahead, Tanya. Uh, yes, um, the whole idea of being a fly mm -hmm. and a human, sharing mm -hmm. the idea of death, as I said before, it's it's. it's like we are weak like there's stuff that happens in life that makes us so vulnerable and weak that could yes. get us to death like sickness illness like yes. it could happen in a second you didn't yeah. like you didn't know just like when you hit a fly a fly wouldn't know like she's gonna like face death when you're gonna hit her on this yeah. exact moment yes and also the idea you can also we spoke about nature in relation to human beings. We also talk about fate. Where uh, I remember very vividly in one of, uh, I think, Shakespeare's plays, it was perhaps King Lear, one of the characters, was referring to the fact that we are uh, playthings in the hands of fate. Right? We're, we're, we're here today, perhaps we don't know what, what the future holds for us. Uh, yeah, um, an hour uh, or perhaps a minute from now, right? Well, well, yes. Like our fate is a noun, but like we we can like direct ourselves into the good fate, but it's still a noun. Like, what's gonna happen the next hour? Am I gonna yeah. still be alive? I'm gonna fail. Mm. I'm gonna succeed. It's still like a noun for us. Yes, yes. That this is uh, one of the ideas. So again, um, again, as as what is also interesting about flies is uh, fly. and flying is good, right? Who wouldn't like to be uh, uh, perhaps? Uh, who wouldn't like to fly? And if if you ask people about their wishes or uh, about uh, things that you they would like to to be or have or, or have they would say uh, or, um, I would I would like to have the ability to fly right isn't that uh, one of perhaps your wishes or dreams to at one point fly yes well I fly away from the here and the now and <laughs> right uh, from the uh, 
Okay. So when when you fly, uh, uh, we're assuming, of course, that flies and all the other uh, creatures that have the ability to fly, we're under the impression that they are happy, right? Because they are not restricted and chained, right? Compare yes. between a caged bird and a bird that is out of a cage. Which of them you think is uh, happier? The free bird, of course. Uh, of course, right? Yeah, like no one likes to be held okay. hostage. Yes, absolutely. Yes, naturally. So no matter how happy and how free the fly or any bird for that matter is, they can be caught by a human being and they can be brushed away, right? So, uh, which is an indication that uh, if you feel happy, uh, you shouldn't be too happy about it because you don't know what, what happens next, right? Um, it's exactly, I mean, I, I, I remember a very interesting, um, you know, uh, Indian wise say, and it says, never say happy until you die. Never say happy until you die, whatever that means. Never say happy until you die. Uh, can I answer? Ah, absolutely. Yeah, go ahead. It, it, it means that you shouldn't confirm that you're happy in your life until until the end of it. Ah, yes. So uh, today you're happy and you, you don't know. Uh, if you're going yeah. to die tomorrow, that's fine. So you're yeah. happy, right? But, but tomorrow then you might have a bad day. Absolutely. This is, this is it. Are you getting the idea? Yes. So again, typically a bird or a fly in, in our case would be happy playing, but uh, perhaps tomorrow we will have the, the thoughtless hand of a human being and that would be the end of the story, right? No more happiness. Okay. So, as you can see, the poet has a, 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 I don't normally refer to the, the, to, uh, the poem in terms of a poet. I don't say the poet because uh, we have to make this distinction between the poet and the persona of the poet. I, I, I want you to learn this word. Persona, persona means that um, we're not talking about the poet. The poet is the creator of the poem, but uh, whoever is speaking in the poem is not the poet. It's the persona of the poet, a character, if you like. Okay? Like uh, when we talk about short stories and novels and we keep saying that we have to separate and we have to be aware of the fact that the novelist is something and the narrator or the narrator is somebody else. You shouldn't be mixing the two together. It's the same thing. So the persona of the poem, in order to convince, uh, this is the intellectual part of the poem. I, I said it's a, when somebody has a project uh, and the project is obviously about equating human life to the life of insects in its, in the la, in, in its fr fr fragility, the fact that uh, the life of an insect is very fragile. It only takes a, a, a hand, and, and a hand of a child, I wouldn't say an adult, a hand of a child to end the life of a fly, right? It's trying to establish the fact that uh, the human being is, or the fly is exactly like a human being. 
um, what are the qualities that we have for human beings? They drink, they sing, right? They play. These are free, they, these are all things that human beings do, do, right? So now that he has established the fact that the two are similar and are or perhaps have the same fate in the final analysis, right? Yeah, they share the same, uh, you know, uh, perhaps destiny and fate. The fact that it takes uh, uh, a thoughtless hand um, to to um, to bring everything to a halt, to a close, to an end. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. All right. Again. Um, obviously, um, you wouldn't be happy about this comparison because if any of how short life is, it, if anything, it shows you uh, the vanity of human wishes and you, you start asking yourself, what am I doing? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm getting training, training here and there in order to get a certificate, in order to get promoted. Um, I want to get married and uh, I want to have kids. I want to, uh, to be a professor. I want to do this. I want to travel the world. You come. How, how uh, many finish and finish? Uh, wait, let me finish. Let me finish. And the rude awakening is that it's all for nothing because no matter how long you will live, you will eventually die. So this is pointing to the vanity of human wishes, if you like. Okay. Again, uh, when you look at the last stanza, there is a total change of heart. Look at it. The, the person very pessimistic and very negative all through, right? But look at the end, the, the last stanza. Then am I a happy fly if I live uh, or if I die? What's that? Is he contradicting himself? No. He's being kind of uh, neutral. Uh, perhaps he's being kind of uh, um, religious. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah, kind of. Yeah. I mean, in, in the sense that uh, we as uh, believers know that everything is uh, in the hands of God, a benevolent God. It's so going no matter. Yeah we, yeah, we know that we, uh, we submit to the fact that at one we resign to the fact that at one point we will die, which is fine because we, uh, we perhaps uh, did our homework. We uh, prayed, we, uh, we uh, gave the poor and everything, right? Yeah. So the, the, the last part is kind of surprising and strange. Because uh, you see that we have this sense of, they call it uh, predestination. You believe in predestination, that everything is dictated by God. Everything is controlled by God and you trust God. You know that everything is always for the best, right? What do you think? Yes, that's true. Everything oh. in the end is in the hands of God. Yes, absolutely. Uh, you may read it in a different way, and I'm, I'm just giving you my reading of it. See, this is the beauty of poetry. Um, you don't have one single interpretation. We yeah, there's a variety. That, yes, absolutely. Yes, this is the beauty of it doesn't lend itself to one easy, one single easy interpretation. No, this is not poetry. 
Are you getting the idea? Yes, it's kind of the same with the art of Cezanne, where uh, some people took it politically. Yes. Of the art. Yes. Yes, absolutely. I mean, uh, the sky is the limit when it comes to the interpretation of poetry, if you like. Okay. So uh, can we move somewhere else? Um, I guess we will have to have uh, an extra class, right? We got carried away with the, <laughs> with the poem. And uh, yeah, which is fine. Uh, at least uh, I'm hopeful that you, you're enjoying it as much as I am. Thank you, teacher. You're welcome. Let's move somewhere else, everyone. Uh, I'm not going to read the commentary because this is what we, we've been talking about. So I'll leave that for you. I'll, I'll go to the next poem. Yeah, I'll go to the flea. And I would like you to read the flea. Yeah, at least we read it, at least we come up with ideas about it, and we, we leave the rest for the extra class. How about that? Okay. So read the flea and tell me what. I uh, mute, mute, mute the mic like we always do and uh, read it and see uh, so what, what is it that you can come out with. I'll give you uh, perhaps four minutes for that because it's a little bit long. The stanzas are bigger in size. Go ahead.
Joman and Nagar. Hello? Yes. Okay. yes doctor. Can we first of all set this poem against the other one in terms of accessibility, uh, in terms of ideas, in terms of diction. Diction means the, the vocab items, the poetic diction used. So which of them is perhaps um, harder? It's harder than a plague's uh, poem. Uh, plague's uh, poem is simple and it has uh, short lines and stanzas. Uh, here we can see like uh, long lines and stanzas. Interesting. Okay. Uh, thank you, Salsa. Can we have somebody else? Impressions of this poem as set against the, the other one? Uh, teacher, th this one is much more complicated, and mm -hmm. uh, uh, the first one is more simplified and easy for any any reader. Okay. But this one is like more detailed and interesting. Yeah. Okay, that's that's interesting. Anybody else? Okay, interesting. So we we'll all agreed on the fact that this is perhaps, um, um, I mean, considerably long, um, bigger in stances. Um, I mean, the lines are also long. I mean, remember, with Blake, you have the lines are very short, and uh, perhaps the lines were short in order to also indicate that the life of the fly is short and the life of the human being is short. See, see how the form serves the message or the meaning of the poem. You have lines, uh, you have short lines because life is short itself, right? Okay, uh, this time around it's different. Um, that it's longer, um, uh, perhaps more complicated, right? Okay. Let's look at the diction. Remember the poetic diction? Poetic diction means uh, words that are exclusive to poetry. Because if you use them outside a poetic context, you would be accused of being mutakar. Right, of being pedantic, they call it pedantic. Okay, so uh, do we have words that were, I mean, that we wouldn't use in, in normal life and under normal circumstances? Now look at the word <clears throat> yieldest. You normally yield to something, you don't yieldest. Yieldest is obviously um, a poetic word. Thou, and you have the word thou, how little that which thou deniest. So you, have, you don't have deny, you have deniest. This is old English and this is poetic fiction. Uh, it sucked me first and now it sucks thee. Thee means you, right? Thou, thou, you means you. Knowest means no, right? Uh, 
Okay, so it has its own diction. Okay. Um, okay, so what's the idea? And whether the idea is as easy as it was in the previous poem. What do you think? <clears throat> Are you tired? Should we call it a night and um, pick this up again in an extra class? Okay. Okay. Uh, doctor, I have a question. Um, uh, not about the class, but about the uh, TMA. Yeah. What about it? It's next week, right? Inshallah. Will it be online or? Uh... Yeah, online. Okay, but what, what what do we do exactly? Uh, well, um, it's it's going to be um, uh, obviously you'll have choices, and you choose to write an essay on one of those uh, choices. Um, I think it's going to be one hour and a half, and a half, if I'm not mistaken, and it's going to be during class. So next week, not next week, I'll be teaching for only half an hour. And the rest of the class will be on LMS. You go to LMS, you um, do the, I don't know whether it's going to be a file that you have to download and then upload, or that's going to be uh, questions on the LMS that you perhaps type and everything. Okay, thank okay. you, doctor. Um, so um, no, it's, it's good that you, you brought this up, Hamza, because uh, I wanted to talk about them. Yes, um, I uh, yeah. Teacher, one more question, if you don't mind. Yes. Please. Um, in the thirteenth week, we'll have a quiz for this chapter, right? Um, yeah, inshallah. Uh, I mean, we have a plan. The, the scheme is on the assessment scheme or plan is on on the LMS. Yeah, but but the plan is wrong. It's saying uh, book two, chapter one, in the thirteenth week. Uh, which we have already done, right? Yeah, we already finished. Right, I'll, I'll, I'll talk to the BCC and see what so will come after Charlie. Don't worry. Okay. Charlie. okay. Thank you, Doctor. You're welcome. Yeah. Um, Andrew, can I ask yes. something? Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. So you said we have to choose from specific topics. Are the topics related to the to the chapters, or are they like um, like from outside the chapter? Yeah. I mean, uh, what do you think? Yeah. Uh, it, 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 it's, it says it says it's from book one, chapter one and two, and book two, chapter one. And yeah, the, uh, the essay. Okay. The essay, I mean. The essay would be, um, you, you, like I said, you you may have perhaps two topics to uh, write on one of them, and the topics are based on and and inspired uh, by uh, what we what we did with Kiliobatra. You can have a question on Kiliobatra. You can have a question on Plato. You can have a question uh, on who else? On um, Christopher uh, Martin. Martin. Right? right? So yes, we're, going, sure. we're going to have, um, I mean, at your request, I know some, uh, sometimes we will um, exhibit some, um, you know, kind of concerns about uh, Cezanne and you said uh, if you're going to vote, you're going to vote Cezanne down as the, the worst chapter, right? Uh, we decided that we were, we're not going to include Cezanne in uh, the TM, in the end class TM. So like I said, you have Plato, <clears throat> you have Cleopatra, and you have uh, Christopher Mark. I think this is fair enough. Uh, like I said, you're going to, um, to have choices. You choose um, one, one, and then you write an essay. Again, uh, let's agree on, on, the, um, um, on the extra class. Can we have the extra class on, on Monday? 
Next Monday? Yes. Yeah, that's fine, I guess. So Monday at 4 p.m., how about that? Yeah, it's okay. Yeah, it's okay. Okay, yes. so Monday at 4 p.m., everyone. Um, my understanding is that the, the TMA is going to be during class, and our class is on Wednesday, right? Doctor, it's one hour and a half, the TMA. Inshallah. Okay. Top, top doctor, um, yes. the question about the essay, is it going to be a specific point in the chapter or like generally about um, like the person like Kilibata in general or fastest? No, of course it has to be specific. I mean, um, we don't expect you to write everything. That's why we're going to ask you specific questions. Right? Right. Yeah, from right. Uh, my okay. own, yeah. Your own what? My own word. Uh, yeah, your own words. Okay, thank you, doctor. You work. Type uh, with this item and on this note, we come to the end of uh, tonight's class. Thank you so much, and I wish you all the best. Salam alaikum. Thank you so much. Thank Have you, a good doctor. day. Thank you, Shukran Jazeel. Thank you, doctor. You work. Ma'asalam. Hafizullah. Like.